Hello, hello, hello. It's 2pm in the UK. It's a Monday. It's time for this week in WordPress. It's episode <laughs> number 225. Good grief. What was I thinking all those years ago? We are joined by a fabulous team of people this week. We've got uh, plenty to talk about, including a <laughs> one, of the, one of the real big WP dramas that's happened in my lifetime. And so we'll try and get our nails into that a little bit. But first of all, just uh, just a couple of things about around the, the show. If you're interested in making a comment, then feel free to do that. The best way to do that is to uh, either go to our Facebook group, which is wpbuilds.com forward slash Facebook, or you could go to our website, wpbuilds.com forward slash live. If you join us on Facebook, they have a rule whereby they won't share your avatar or name with us if you want to comment. So you have to click a link, which will be in the, uh, the, the thing at the top. But anyway, you'll need to go to chat.restream.io forward slash FB and click on the link and that will de-anonymize you. Uh, but please feel free to share this one. This is probably the easiest one because it's wide open to the public, wpbuilds.com forward slash live. I'll leave that on the screen just for a few moments. First up, though, to introduce my my co-host for this week, we have a round robin panel of co-hosts. There she is. It's <laughs> Michelle Frechette. How are you doing, Michelle? I am well. How are you? I'm really good. We we have this little process where I start the the show and then I've got two, the two minutes countdown comes on. About halfway through that, the doorbell rang and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, "Do I go and get it? I know what it is. It's a package. I have 60 seconds to get there and get back." And I did it. <laughs> totally did it. I'm feeling like a champion. Got back, signed for the package, everything. Anyway, Michelle Frechette, she's joining us again. Uh, Matt Mullenweg called her the busiest woman in WordPress, but in addition <laughs> to all that, uh, she works at Stella WP. Um, she is also the podcast barista at WP Coffee Talk. She's the co-founder. I've got to take a breath for all this. I forgot about that. She's the co-founder of underrepresentedintech.com, the creator of wpcareerpages.com, the president of the board of bigorangeheart.org, director of community relations over at a, a, and a contributor, I should say, at poststatus.com. She's an author, business coach, and frequent organizer and speaker at WordCamp events. She lives outside Rochester, New York, and she's an avid nature photographer. And she's got her own website where you can learn more about her. It's called meetmichelle.online. And I need to update it. I've added a podcast since I Oh, yes, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> WP Motivate also, uh, right? Uh, right, and I don't know why my camera's... Painful, I'm oh, sorry. Michelle, if your camera does balk in that way, don't worry. Just refresh the page and okay. I'll let you straight back in. So don't yes. worry about it. Anyway, absolute pleasure to have you on. I wish I could say the same about the gentleman on my left or right. I don't know, him <laughs> over there. But uh, it's Mark Westgard. How are you doing, Mark? Doing good. Mark, How are you doing, Nathan? Just do this for me, would you? Just, you love like, this. Just go like, what, hap <laughs> what happens to Mark's hands? <laughs> <laughs> Where do Mark's hands go? It's like some kind of alternative universe there. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. We'll be talking a little bit more with him about all sorts of plugin-related stuff later. If you don't know Mark, he is the founder of the WordPress form plugin called WS Form. Stop what you're doing. Go and Google WS Form. Uh, it's a powerful form builder that allows you to create professional, mobile-friendly, accessible forms. Oh, and I'm going to give you the URL because he's given me it in the show notes. And it's at wsform.com. What else would it be? wsform.com. And anyway, thank you for joining us again, Mark. Really appreciate thank you for having it. me. You're welcome. Um, Mark's got one more trick about his room, which he's going to show us a little bit later, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, and finally, first time on the show. This is really nice. I love it when we have new people on the show. It's not to say that I don't love returning guests, because I do. But we have uh, James Giroux. How are you doing, James? I'm doing well. It's very nice to have you. I've got to say, I'm really liking your the setup in your room. It looks very, <laughs> very, like, really nice. It's uh, it, For those that are listening to the audio, James has got a beautiful kind of moody setup going on there. It looks very nice. Well done. Bravo. Um, and James is, well, he has been part of the WordPress community for over a decade. He's been an agency owner, product developer, uh, marketplace employee, community wrangler, and is now a blogger and the director of brand and product marketing also at Stella WP. Thank you for joining and, us today. And can we say happy Thanksgiving to you, James? James is in Canada, and today I is am. Canadian Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving. It is. 
Can you give me my complete ignorance of that? What's the the only little bit of the whole Thanksgiving piece that I know about is the American side, and, and even that knowledge is very modest. What's the why is there a difference there? What what was the event that occurred which made it today? <sighs> I, I've looked up the history a little while ago, and, and I'm sure there's some specific nuance, but I think for the most part, it's just that because we're further north, our harvest is about a month earlier, and that probably is the, the key one for the dates. Also, it could be related to the queen and something like that, so yeah. you never know. Yeah. Oh, we don't. oh, and Courtney, Courtney does point out that today is also Indigenous People's Day in the United States. Oh, thank you, Courtney. Yes. Well, there we go. That's an apropos. Thank you good time to uh, yes. good time to mention a few people here. Courtney's joining us. Thank you, Courtney. She says good day. Uh, and as um, Michelle just said, she's also mentioning that it's Indigenous People's Day in the USA as well. Thank you. And we've also got Marcus Burnett joining us. Good morning to this lovely group. Thank you. Uh, feel free to drop a comment in. Tell us where you are. Um, and, you know, if you've got any commentary on uh, anything that we say, we love to hear all of that. And we'll try to put as many it's Not, on as not me can. just wondering. I'm like, I wonder where Peter Ingersoll is. He's usually yeah. here. And there. <laughs> he just turned up. <laughs> good morning, not... Peter. It's always good to see you in here. <laughs> I don't, I'm not happy with Peter. It's 13 minutes past and he's yet to what write the card. I was thinking, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, what did I do? Thank you, Peter. As as always, I don't mean that in a comedy way. I'm not really possible. Uh, thanks for joining us. Okay, so it's a WordPress podcast, so we should probably mention all of the WordPressy stuff. Quick first thing, bit a bit, couple of bits of self promotion. I hope you don't mind. This is our website, wpbuilds.com. It's sponsored by um, Marcus's company, Marcus Burnett. We just mentioned him in the show. And it's sponsored by GoDaddy Pro, and uh, we're also kind of plugging a couple of things this week. You'll notice at the top. Uh, we've got the WP Builds Black Friday page. If you click on that link, you go to the URL wpbuilds.com forward slash black. And what we're going to do over the days and weeks to come is we're going to be starting to put all the WordPress deals that we hear about on here. And essentially what we end up with is a, is a great big long list down here. There's probably about seven or eight at the moment. Um, but usually by the time Black Friday rolls around, there's like two or 300 on there. It's pretty good for, you know, you can search and filter things by different categories and price and things like that. Um, and it's at wpbuilds.com forward slash black. You can see here, very cheekily, um, Mark Westgard has decided to get in at the top <laughs> with some, some sponsorship of this, as has GoDaddy Pro. But there's a few sponsor slots available if you're interested in uh, getting on that page. But listing your product is completely free. Uh, and all you do is you click this button, add your deal, and it brings up a form and you just fill it out and we'll stick it on there. Uh, I had a few this week that were to do with like t-shirts and there was one to do with farming and oh. and I uh, <laughs> I haven't uh, I haven't authorized those. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, it's a WordPress deal. If it's nothing to do with WordPress, just don't bother because uh, I won't be publishing it. But anyway, there's that. So Anybody that submits something, hopefully, if you submit it correctly, we'll get you on the on the website. And let's get stuck into some of the stuff that we're going to be mentioning today. Where should we start? Okay, let's start here. I don't know if any of the team on the show today have got any um, got anything to say about this. I doubt it, but I like to mention these things anyway. It's just to say that WordPress 6.1 Beta 3 is now available. If you're new to WordPress, it goes through these beta cycles whereby the software is not really ready for public consumption, but it's ready, generally speaking, and it needs to be uh, it needs to be tested and hammered by a bunch of users. And the idea is that fault is found, or hopefully no fault is found. But if there is fault found, it's reported back. If you want to go and be a user, uh, sorry, a beta tester, then that's an easy thing to do. Just go, probably the best thing to do is to Google uh, WordPress beta testing, and you'll probably get some links there. But uh, just to say that 6.3 is out. And so we're not, we're closing in on WordPress 6.1. Uh, it will be in November, so it's coming up fast. But if you want to test that out, go and uh, get yourself signed up. We'd all be very grateful. Anybody got anything to add to that? I doubt it. Uh, there, well, there was an article oh, on thanks. October 7th from Johnny Harris um, talking about the WP query performance improvements in 6.1, which is quite interesting. Go so they're going to start caching WP query requests in WordPress, which is going to be um, a nice performance improvement in, in WordPress. So basically, if somebody were to, I don't know, even just list a, uh, a list of blog articles on your website. It's going to cache that. So next time someone comes along, it's going to refresh much, much quicker. So 
Um, hopefully that's going to be the start of more performance uh, related stuff in WordPress to improve the performance. Yeah, the performance team have been doing really good mm. work in the last few months. I mean, from from a complete standing start, I don't know how many months ago, but it's it's only a matter of months really to a lot of the new things that have been yeah. added in. Have you, yeah. um, have do you, Mark, do you keep a particularly close eye on these kind of things? Because obviously, you know, your plugin has to work the day this comes out. So mm. yeah, yeah, the minute they bring out a beta, I installed it on our development servers and we, we test it to make sure everything's working properly. But this one... You know, developers need to be aware of because there can be implications with it. If you make a, an update to a post in the database, then subsequent calls may not show that update. So there's certain things you have to call to clear the cache and make sure that any updates have uh, have been registered. So, um, yeah, worth, worth having a look at that. Uh, it's on the make.wordpress.org um, core blog on there. So you can have a look at that and learn more about it. I'll put, I'll put it in the... Uh, yeah, if you if you add it in, I will add it into the show notes that accompany this when it actually yeah. goes live. Thank you. Cool. And what about you, James? In the show notes, I confess I'm not um, aware of which product, but you described yourself as a product developer. Um, is this something you keep a close watch on? Oh, not in many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> Take your foot off that I, uh, pedal, yeah. Yeah. You know, I used to, to create plugins and themes about, oh, golly, eight years ago now. And... Uh, have since moved on to other things. Okay. So there we go. I will, well, why not, Mark? I'll just shove it on the page now and then uh, I will it's be quite reminded. quite a long URL, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> never mind. I'll try and shorten it for the for the show notes. There we go. Uh, it's over at make.wordpress.org and it's called Improvements to WP underscore Query Performance in 6.1 by Johnny Harris. And you can yeah. uh, go and have a good long look at that. Okay. Great. I'll leave that in and we can look at that for the show notes. All righty. Okay, there's an event coming up fairly soon uh, in just a matter of weeks. It's called WP Accessibility Day. Uh, hopefully, by now, um, you have an understanding of what accessibility requirements are in WordPress. If not, there's a whole host of resources out there. But one of the things which happens is the Accessibility Day. And it's taking place this November 2nd to the 3rd. And it is a one-day, 24 uh, hour event with talks uh, building about building accessible WordPress websites. It's independently organized by volunteers from the accessibility team and community members. The schedule, according to this WP Tavern post, which I'm showing on the screen at the moment, the schedule is currently password protected. That may no longer be the case because this is now four days out of date. Um, it is available. But oh, great. Okay, let me let me click on that and see if it's actually up there now. Yeah, there we go. Great. So you can now see the. Uh, you can now see who's speaking. It's wpaccessibility.day. I love that. wpaccessibility.day is their URL, and you can go and see who is taking part and when all of the bits and pieces are, and so on and so forth. So I know this is something that's dear to many people's hearts. Anybody got anything to add to this? I'm excited about it. I'm happy that they're doing it. I am slightly disappointed that it is only website accessibility and not community accessibility too. Tell me more so, about what you're thinking there. When you say community accessibility, so, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. So it's all about the online. It's not about the when we get together in person. So, you know, a few weeks ago, I wrote an article yeah. about the, the difficulties that I had at, at WordCamp US. And accessibility within our community isn't just websites. Accessibility within our community extends beyond websites. So I applaud this. I am not putting this down in any way, shape, or form. Just a little disappointed that that we're not talking about more in our community than what's on our screens. You you really sort of trumpeted that a couple of weeks ago, and it got it seemed to get an awful lot of interest. There was a lot of people who chimed in over on Twitter and various other places. We mentioned it over here, mm -hmm. and and I'm just wondering if you in a in a way I'm wondering if you did fire a, an opening volley there. In that I don't know that it was on the the top of everybody's yeah. minds, but maybe. Uh, this mm -hmm. this speaker list and everything was already you know locked down and and so on. I don't know. And, I, no, I might have applied. No. I might have applied to speak. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't expect you know. I don't I don't expect to be chosen for everything, and I understand that they have a mission, and that that is web accessibility. I would just personally love to see um, accessibility and A L L Y A one one Y. I always see the L's. I don't know why, because we say ally, right? But A one one Y extend beyond just the screen to yeah. be inclusive communities when we are also meeting in person. That's just my personal wish. 
Peter Ingersoll, uh, he says that previous Accessibility Day talks have been some of the best that he's uh, seen, which is really great. Highly recommended. Yeah, so go and get yourself signed up. That sounds like a really a noteworthy thing to do. Just quickly give you the dates again. It is November the 2nd uh, to 3rd, so in a few weeks' time. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to the next one. Right, this this one I think we'll probably keep going for for a fairly lengthy period of time. I know Mark's got quite a lot to say, being a developer. This is a piece over at <laughs> Michelle's chuckling. Um, just, was it was it I, the sentence Mark's got quite a lot to say? I mean, I was going to say, when does he not have a lot to say? <laughs> when I put him on mute, I'm only going to say a few sentences now. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll prime this subject, then put him on mute and we can watch as he doesn't speak. Uh, okay, so this is Jonathan Wold at jonathanwold.com. He produced a piece, uh, it's a couple of weeks ago, but I, I didn't manage to catch sight of it, and so I added it in anyway. It's September the 29th. It's called Using the Loop to Grow a WordPress Product Business. Jonathan, if you don't know him, he's making it the sort of his mission in life, really, to assist uh, WordPress companies to go from where they are now to where they desire to be. And a lot of that is tied up with partnerships as a sort of quick way to short circuit the, your growth strategy. In other words, to, to hook up with existing businesses, maybe a very successful business, maybe somebody that's in the same position as you or whatever it may be, and then identify some key areas where together you can combine your marketing budget, you're combining your power uh, to get some stuff done. And so he's launched this piece. It's called Using the Loop to Grow a WordPress Product Company. And he doesn't mean the WordPress loop, just so that you're clear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I read that and thought, what? <laughs> um, what he's basically saying is that he thinks that there's really every possibility that if you launch a WordPress product business and it's got an audience and there is a market for it, you you can achieve success. Now, whether or not you're as as, um, as positive as Jonathan would be, he's basically saying it's, in fact, I think he at some point uses the word, it's almost inevitable that you will succeed. But he identifies three problems. And I, I totally get this because I've seen this myself. Um, and the problems are thus, are thus. Monetization, in other words, the you know, he says the business model and pricing needs to be aligned with the values of both the customer and the company. Distribution is the second of those. Potential customers just need to know that you're around. That's another huge thing. And he makes the point that how many times have you seen a WordPress product which you just imagine came out yesterday and then discover it's more than a decade old? And then compatibility. It's got to be able to work throughout the ecosystem. So it's got to be tested with popular plugins and themes and make sure it works. So they're the problems. And then his, his strategies... Uh, for building a solid foundation are to be customer centric, to enforce that or at least work on that compatibility, to make sure that your business model is speaking to your audience, to make sure that your leadership team are empowered to achieve whatever it is that you've got to do and to be active in the community. Da -da, here's Mark. Look, like fighting the good fight. He's being in community, right? Um, and then he's, so here's the loop that he's talking about. In order to achieve this and make it grow, he, he reckons that here's the three things you need to do. Forge partnerships, um, decide between those partners, however many they are. And I think he's basically advocating go for one at the beginning, but set out a win, set out one thing which you're going to both do together and measure it and make it happen. And don't give up until you've got that win. Then when you get that win, uh, talk about it. Go on uh, blog posts, go on things like a podcast like this, and then talk about it. So there I am droning on about it. I've only just realized I didn't put it on the screen. Duh. Um, <laughs> but this is the article. Um, but yeah, so having said all of that, uh, what do you reckon, Mark? I'm going to put him on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I think this article hits the spot with um, particularly smaller plugin developers or more recent plugin developers such as myself um, in, in terms of, of getting your name out there, getting your product out there. Um, these types of partnerships are very, very important. I think where Jonathan can help people where, and where I think it's really important is that those strategic relationships have got to have some body behind them. There's got to be something mutual between those two people that is going to make that partnership work um you know one of the reasons i went to work camp us this time and didn't sponsor it was i, I just wanted to meet people and build relationships with people and, and try to build some more partnerships um and it's not just a case of going to these companies and saying hey 
can I do a blog post with you? There needs to be something mutually beneficial between those, those companies. So, for example, I've done some stuff with GoDaddy Pro, and it's been a case of, okay, they've got an audience that wants to hear about new technologies and wants to learn more about plugins and things like that. I've got a product that I want to get out there. That partnership worked well, um, and that's going to be an ongoing partnership we work with. Um, doing stuff with Nathan, WP Builds, um, being able to contribute to the show and, and sponsor things helps Nathan out, helps me out because I can get my name out there. Um, so it's, it's a lot of that. Um, I think on the, you know, some of the other points that he was making about the compatibility and stuff like that, um, compatibility is, is a big thing in the plugin space. You've got thousands of plugins out there. Um, so it's definitely important to focus on the main plugins that are out there, making sure you're compatible with them. Um, even if you don't have that in your own stack, just install it, try it out. I mean, our, the development server I have that we do stuff with WS4, we've got over 200 plugins on there. Um, and we've made like wow. the, the worst possible WordPress yeah. <laughs> environment possible to test the product with. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's that's a, an important part. Of, there's so many different parts of being um a plugin company to make it successful is you know these partnerships are important obviously but the pl product's got to have worth it's got to fill a niche um, it's got to be compatible with all the other plugins that are out there so you don't have people having problems you've got to provide excellent customer service uh, excellent customer service in turn results in more customers you're going to get word of mouth traffic as a result of that um, but yeah I, I actually had a chat with uh, jonathan about this over the weekend and Hopefully, I'm going to be talking to him a little bit more about it to see if we can work together on stuff. So, uh, I appreciate the article. I think it's I think it's great. I think uh, Michelle, um, Michelle, and James, do you think he's finished yet? I mean, I didn't hear a word he said. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you're on it's mute, just, Mark. It's interesting just watching his mouth go like that. Yeah, you're right? on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Just showing you my teeth. That's yeah, all. that's right. Now, all of that was great. Sorry, James. You were not. As I was going through the article, I could see you just nodding repeatedly. So I, I want to bring you in at this point. Yeah. Well, this is an area of focus for me right now, especially at Stellar, um, is is building up partnerships um, and speaking from uh, a family of brands and and that perspective, and maybe a larger footprint in the WordPress ecosystem. This is um, an area of great opportunity for us as well, because we're always looking for opportunities to add value to the customer experience, right? And we know our products hit very specific targeted uh, features and functionality that customers are after, that users are after, and that we are not the be-all, end-all. So finding those complementary products and complementary services that allow us to um, help our customers achieve that win that they're after I mean, that's hugely valuable to us. So um, what Jonathan has done here, I think, is a great, uh, is giving permission to a lot of WordPress uh, plugin companies and product companies to just ask, right? Go out and ask, look for those opportunities. I mean, I'll put my hand up and say partnerships are open at Stellar. So if you want to reach me on Twitter, go ahead and do that. Um, but it's a really great opportunity to find opportunities um, and how Jonathan describes it um, of, of looking for that first win. I mean, that's a hugely, hugely strategic and valuable approach to take um, because it makes the initial engagement, uh, and I would say, make it something small. Don't try to achieve a big win. Try to achieve a small win, but make sure that you tout that and that you are celebrating that, especially with a partner that's maybe larger than you are, because that's going to reinforce that trust, reinforce that relationship and give them something to talk about internally. Because one thing a lot of smaller plugin companies don't realize is we have external communications and external stakeholders, but we also have internal communications and internal stakeholders. And we need to sell those partnerships internally as much as we sell them externally. Huh, and um, yeah. yeah, and so being able to, to help um, those of us inside share those wins and share those stories is really helpful as well. What James? What 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 do you see when you hear Jonathan or Ross talking about a partnership? What what is it that you're thinking there? Because I know that in the in the recent past, Stella WP came about. Well, I could be wrong about this, but it felt like Stella WP came about because of an acquisition landscape where you know you needed sort of like an umbrella name to put all of these different pieces of the puzzle together under. Um, but you're, I'm guessing you're not talking about that here. You're not talking about acquisitions. You are. 
talking about partnering up with people who have got a product. They don't want to be acquired. They just want to do something together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. I mean, acquisition is always a pathway and, and we continue to be open to those conversations. Um, but mm -hmm. I think for the most part, yeah, it's about identifying um, friends, right? Like th that's the one great thing about WordPress is WordPress has always been foundationally about people and the relational connection and the community connection and working together to achieve uh, or to create value for both sides, I think is, is something worthwhile. And especially now as we move into a period of uncertainty in the world economy, um, I think uh, partnerships are a really strategic opportunity where the risk is significantly lower than doing something with a bit more upfront investment. So um, something else to think about um, yeah. for small companies as well. Yeah, I think those partnerships are much more effective as well in, in terms of reaching the people that you want to reach. Because if I communicate my product through, say, paid advertising, that's coming from my voice. Um, if I work with a partnership company who believes in my product and they talk about it, it's got a lot more clout, um, mm. and mm, we, you know we'll get we'll get much we get much better conversion rates uh, as as a result of that. So, and it's it's a time consuming process to do it. You know, building partnerships is not just send an email to to James and say, hey, let's do something together. <laughs> um, you have to work at it. You've got to produce. You do good content you've got to and, and just like you said james it's it's about friendships it's about relationships um you know everybody on the screen right now and people that are uh, chatting in in the log i know a lot of these people because we have that relationship with each other um and that's that's for me has been that's been a big learning curve for me from the other businesses that i've had in the past has been how important the community is in wordpress and how important it is to have those relationships because traditional marketing doesn't necessarily work as effectively as working with these partnerships. You're working with companies that have been around for a long time, have huge audiences. And if you can get that partnership right, it can be a very valuable way of marketing your business. Yeah. I, I So Mark, you, you represent a really good example of this. You, you won't know, nobody will know this, Mark knows this, that we did a, I did a, me and David Wormsley did a podcast episode, oh, 18 months ago, and it was about forms. It was just about WordPress forms. Neither me nor David had ever heard of WS form. Forgive me, Mark, I will, but we hadn't, and so, but yeah. we included it. We put a link to say there's this one called <clears throat> WS forms, and it seems to be getting some traction. Within like three days, Mark had reached out to me and 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 from there it just all went downhill and here he is now um <laughs> but no but it was it would oh, sorry i can't help being sarcastic but it was really great he got in touch with me i think we ended up on a zoom call in that first week just chatting yeah. through and i was like well, yeah. what 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 do we want to do together what is and, it yeah what what is that and uh, <laughs> and and we just chatted through and and then we met up in person and he's been on a podcast episode i don't know if that's helped or not but it's it's certainly been another yeah, sort of community of outreach yeah. um yeah but it and, and wordpress is like that it's it's mm. lots of little little pockets that you have to be involved in you know um so the stuff that i do with wp builds that doesn't represent 100 percent of my revenue it's it's just lots and lots of little things yeah. that you have to do it's a big right. big community out there yeah um, there's it, no it, sorry michelle go ahead it's a, I, I just want to put my voice in here too a little bit yeah. <laughs> so can you mute him for a second um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with networking though right so like yes it's great you have all these these opportunities, but so many plugin developers are starting as a, a shop of one person who's trying to do the marketing, who's trying to do the networking, who's trying to do the PR and advertising and everything that goes into it and develop it and do their um, support and all of those different things. So it, look for opportunities that can maximize all of those things together. So Mark came to WordCamp US, not as a sponsor this time. You, you sponsored WordCamp Europe though. And you found yep. yourself like at your table all day. Um, and that's great. You still get great opportunities to network, but you can't have necessarily the in-depth conversations that you can when you're wandering around an event like a WordCamp. And so look for those opportunities, make strategic alliances with people. So, you know, Mark and I have become friends. He sponsored 
um, WP Coffee Talk before I even knew who he was or what a WS form was. And, you know, as, as an opportunity now, when we hang out together, I'm constantly introducing. If you hang out with me, I will introduce you to people that I know. Um, and it works, right? So like making those connections because you know other people, it's like the synapses in your brain, all they have to connect somehow, right? That's what a network is about. And so the, the loop is great. It's, it's actually, it's basically a primer for marketing <laughs> if you are starting, a, mm -hmm. especially a small shop because bigger shops are already doing this, but it's combining that PR, that advertising and the st strategic partnerships with your development and other um, more traditional marketing ideas. So it's it's a great step, but there's gotta be a lot of infrastructure and a lot of work that goes into building that too. And that starts with your networking. I've mentioned this before and I have to, I'm gonna caveat this before I say it. Whatever is about to come out of my mouth, forgive me, it's not supposed to sound um, like I'm diminishing people, but I get quite a lot of, um, email and things like that from developers who would like to come on the podcast. And in some cases, it's a li it is a little bit heartbreaking because it's pretty clear they, they're an, an amazing, amazing coder. They've probably got an amazing product, but they haven't quite finessed the website to the point where you go to the website and it's almost like turning the lights off. You know, you go there with great interest and it looks like, oh, I don't know. And this is a strange one as well. There is there is a kind of language barrier problem. And mm -hmm. a lot of the people that we seem to have on this podcast and that we talk with, they're, you know, they're native English speakers. And that seems to sort of play into the equation a little bit as well. Uh, so forgive me for saying all of those things. But sometimes I get get these get these people product owners and what have you trying to get on the podcast and i i just can't because i i just don't even know what they're trying to do or what their sort of pitch is so did, did mm -hmm. do you understand what i'm trying to say there did that make any sense networking is about give and take so if mm -hmm. you are trying to get on a podcast just to shill your business you're not coming at it the right direction because mm -hmm. that's not what partnerships and networking is about it's not one directional it's omnidirectional and yeah. so i've had i've turned people down for wp coffee talk when they send me their pitch to be on the show they've never listened to it they don't know that i ask the same exact set of questions of every single guest and so they they say well i just have this new product i'd love to come on and talk about it i'm like why don't you listen to an episode or two first and then let's talk and see if you're right. a good fit for the for the show because okay, you, you're yeah. only coming at it from a last one directional and okay. in order for you to build these partnerships, it has to be multi-directional. Yeah, well, that's that summed it up more, much more beautifully than I did. I like the way you sort of catch, you phrase that. That's really nice. But yes, there's that. There's some sort of disconnect between people who would have a successful product, and for some reason they come at it slightly, slightly incorrectly. Yeah. Anyway, so as if as if this isn't about to happen, I had in the back of my mind when Mark has finally finished talking <laughs> so i'll uh, uh i'll um mention um main wp because main wp have done a great job of this over the last few weeks i don't know if you noticed they've partnered with seo press uh seo press i think built out their salute so main wp is is like a it's a plugin which you install on a dedicated WordPress website, and then you can update and maintain all your other websites. You you put a child plugin into them and so on and so forth. Well, they've made partnerships in the last few weeks with uh, SEO Press so that you can do the SEO uh, on those websites in the dashboard. But they've also partnered with Atarim. So they're probably three products that we've all heard about. Atarim got a benefit from Main WP and vice versa, SEO Press as well. And probably there's a bit of back robbing going in now between SEO Press and, and um, Atarim. There's probably some conversational back channels that have been established there as well. I don't really know. And so I was going to say that. And then here comes Dennis Dornan, who's the founder of um, Main WP. And he drops in and he says, this article is spot on. It cannot be overstated mm -hmm. how much of a growth factor partnerships can be so yeah just sort of making that same point um hello and uh Anne. Yeah, i was going to say Anne marie there sorry Anne. um she has not heard she had not heard of ws form either until one of the developers she works with went all hallelujah about it <laughs> i'm happy to see that it's made its way onto the wp awards voting oh go and vote for it um and... vote for wp builds too oh that's on there is it yeah it is oh, i okay. voted this morning Oh, did, did you vote for WP Builds? I'm not saying. <laughs> oh, not, <laughs> yeah, not, after, not after this show. Uh, Marcus Bennett There, there saying, might be other podcasts on that list. <laughs> <That's right>. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, partnerships require a fair amount of trust, says Marcus Burnett. That trust is built up through networking. Yes. I think that's a really thing. good point. Um, you know, trust is a big part of it. And often a lot of that trust can start digitally, but it's really mm. solidified in in-person interactions, which just goes to highlight Michelle's point about, um, you know, the power of community and networking and making community so much more accessible, right? That the more we can get um, people of all abilities, language, um, you know, physical uh, ability, whatever, um, able to connect and be together, the more we can build trust in those relationships and create those opportunities. I think, Nathan, what you spoke to as well about the language barrier being a major issue and a major factor. It's a language and culture barrier as right. well. And not right. just, not just um, the spoken language, but the developer language, right? Like I think um, we have developers who speak code, who speak ones and zeros a lot of the time, who don't maybe understand that on the marketing side, we speak design, we speak audience. And the way that they describe their product or the way that they think about their audience can often be a little bit different to how we in marketing speak about audience and speak about creating value. And figuring out how to bridge that language gap can often be an opportunity. Perhaps there's some space for Jonathan or others to talk about you know, how to help developers communicate the value of their product beyond just listing out all the features. Um, uh, to a, a marketer, right? And being able to bridge that gap. Yeah, I think, that was, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, that again sums up what I was clumsily trying to say, um, sort of bridging that gap and, and speaking those different languages, the, the language of marketing, the language of coding or what have you. And the bit that I was trying to make the point of was that a lot of times I'm definitely receiving email from developers and mm. they don't have that marketing now. And so mm. I think I could be wrong about this. And Jonathan Wold, forgive me. I think Jonathan is trying to or is um, becoming a business which is trying to sort of bridge that gap. So if you are the, the person who isn't great at marketing, but you would like to make those partnerships with people, I think Jonathan at JonathanWold.com uh, I think he's uh, maybe somebody that you should be talking to. Yeah. Fast. Jonathan is very, very well connected. So he's, yeah. he's the right person for it. And I think I think he's found a good niche with this uh, venture that he's working on. I think yeah. it's a great, great idea. Another um, quick and I would, I would say don't be afraid to reach out to, to people like myself who work at some of these larger companies either. Like we're always happy to help developers um, bridge that gap as well. It's not... Uh, you know, you have permission to ask. I think actually a better way to build trust is to ask for help, right? Or to ask mm -hmm. for ideas. Um, if a developer came to me and tried to to just talk about their product or or whatever, um, the wall is up. Like, what what are you wanting from me? Because I'm a guardian of our audience, right? I'm a guardian of our user base. And so the first thing I'm I'm looking at is I need to be careful about anything that we introduce. But if you come to me and you say, hey, we've got this product, we've got these features, can you help me figure out how to how to shape this? Or, you know, like, or do you think our marketing is is aligned right to actually communicate that? I actually had a conversation with a prospective partner that I met at WCUS, um, who is a one-man shop or one person shop. And um I had a oh sorry, the door doesn't matter. Right? But no, it's okay. Carry on. <laughs> um yeah. We've got Thanksgiving here. So, of course, all the kids are out wanting to play with our kids who are not here. <laughs> but, um, you know, like uh, and and I got on a call with this person and, you know, looked at their website. And the first couple of, of conversations we had are, you know, how are you communicating the value of your product? And what's the unique selling point here? Right. Or what's different about your product versus what somebody else is? And just asking some of those very marketing type questions helped to get us to a place where um, there was more trust in the relationship. There was a clear value exchange that we could talk through. And in the end, we're probably going to do something with them because we've built that relationship. And that's a mm -hmm. one person shop, you know, who just made a, a connection and, and, you know, was willing to overcome the emotional barrier of meeting new people and showed up at WCS and did it. Nice. 
Okay, a couple of quick comments around that. Firstly, Dennis <laughs> Dennis says, oh, shocks. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, that was in my head before I saw your comment. Um, and then there's a couple of hellos. Hello to Adam from uh, GoDaddy. Hi, Adam. Hello there. And also Max. How are you doing, Max? And Anne as well, but we've already put up a comment from Anne. Uh, like I said, if you want to share this, probably the best way to do that is to go to wpbuilds.com forward slash live. We've got about another, I don't know, 40 minutes or so left. So if you want to drag some of your friends and colleagues in, feel free to do that. Uh, okay, let's move on. Let me share my screen quickly so I don't make that blunder again. This is the WP drama of the week. I feel like I need a jingle for the WP drama section. Like, <laughs> da, 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 or something. It's more Hollywood. Uh, okay, so honestly, I don't know what the impact of this is. Um, and it, it would appear that this story has kind of developed over time. But let me paraphrase it. I'm going to go to two websites. The first one is uh, WP Tavern, Sarah Gooding writing. And then I'm also going to go to making... Uh, WordPress over, but this is the, the meta.track.wordpress.org and all the links will be in the show notes. But essentially this week, um, this, some statistics, uh, some growth data, some install growth data, which was available to plugin developers, kind of mysteriously disappeared um, from the repo. And there were many people who got really frustrated. There seemed to be quite a lot of kind of conspiratorial language going on in the background about people wondering what the possible reason could be for this. You know, some people thinking that there was an, an underhand motive and that the, the stats had been removed for nefarious reasons. It would appear that this uh, piece over here, John James Jacoby, uh, appears to be a party to this. And although... He, he didn't say it quite as explicitly as he might have done. He implies that this was removed because of some kind of security problem. And so if that were the case, one might understand why this was done. One might also understand why it was done without saying anything, because maybe there's a reason not to say anything. Matt Mullenweg um, kind of came in and he he kind of said, well, we're removing them. Give us a good reason to bring them back, which people, again, thought was kind of like the wrong position to take. Why not just explain it? And then a little bit later, so here's the comment here. He says, thanks for your feedback. I do realize that there were a number of third-party commercial and free services scraping these data on mass and using it. If someone has reasons to bring it back that haven't been presented above, please add it to the thread so we have the best possible presentation for the argument to consider. And then a little bit later, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it, so I've got to scroll and scroll and scroll. And there's a lot of commentary on this post. Um, anyway, a little bit later on, here we go. He says, I definitively think, sorry, as has been pointed out, there was never an API made, made for public use or with any promise of availability. People just reversed engineered and exfiltrated the data to create the chart. And then this, I guess, is the, the bit which maybe gives a bit more clarity to it. I definitely think we can show some more stats to plugin authors about their own plugins. And I'm hearing that for newer plugins, every new install can be a motivator. Feedback loops are important. It will take some work, but it's doable. Now, Mark, as a... We're allowing him to speak, by the way, Michelle. Is that okay with you? I'm just getting, a, getting a show of hands. Can Mark... Is it Mark... <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Um, the, as a plugin developer... You were telling me just before we were beginning this call, you were actually looking at this data when it mm. disappeared. Which it is disappeared, right. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on this? Firstly, remove all of the security bit. How do you think the the handling of it went? Like it just literally disappearing for you. Yeah. What was it, the thought process? Well, I think, you know, first of all, so I, I have a, a freemium model. So I have a free version of my plugin. I have a paid version of my plugin. And I think it's important to respect that the plugin directory is it's essentially free for me to use it. I, I can put my software up there. Um, WordPress don't charge me to do that. They, they pay for the hosting behind it. Um, it's not something that I expect any kind of service level from. Um, it's I, the, 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 the piece that they're talking about is the, was the active installs data on the on, on your plugin page, which is available to everybody. It's not just available to me. So you can go onto any plugin, click on the advanced view, and you can see the stats about the, the plugins. 
And the way those, there are two graphs there. Um, there's ones that shows downloads per day and there's one that shows active installs. So the active installs is showing you by week, I believe it is, what percentage increase or decrease you've had on your plugin, which is a, it's a good indicator to, for a number of reasons, it can show you if you've got maybe some issues with a recent update that you pushed, if your active installs drop down, maybe you've got a bug in there that you need to address. Uh, maybe you've done some marketing around your plugin and you mm. expect to see an increase in active installs. So for a lot of plugin developers, it was a, a useful indicator um, to see whether you're going down the right route with, uh, with, with uh, any marketing or external stuff that you're doing. Maybe a partnership that we were just talking about. Is, mm. is that working for you? Um, those two graphs are generated on the page with a couple of background requests that occur. Um, and it basically pulls down, I think it's like a JSON packet of data. And as a result of that, that, pocket, that data is public. And there are a number of different websites that were scraping that data and using it. For example, I like the website Active Installs. It shows me a graph of, of how I'm getting on. Um, it's a very simple website, um, but it just, it just gives me an indication of where I'm going. Am I going in the right direction? So that site now is not going to work because they can't pull down the active install data. So in terms of how it was dealt with, I was kind of shocked that it just suddenly disappeared um, and that I, I couldn't see it anymore. Uh, I know there was some talk around, yeah, maybe it's a security issue. It was, it, it, there was never just a clear upfront statement about why it happened. It was very, where's this gone? And that caused a lot of kind of negative press around this whole thing. Uh, I mean, you see how many comments are on that page. It's, it's yep. immense. Um, huge amount of feedback from people asking, like, you know, why did this Why did this happen? And I don't think there's yet been a clear statement about why it was removed. Now, you know, it's possible that maybe somebody was scraping it too much and, and pulling down too much data and putting too much load on their server. Was it a security issue? Did somebody find that you could SQL inject hack it or something like that? I don't know, and I don't want to speculate what it was. Um, I do think the communication could have been more open and just frank about why it happened. Um, you know, if it was a security issue, don't be ashamed of it. Just say, yeah, we had a problem. We've got to take it offline for a while. Uh, we're going to put it back as soon as we can um, and work on it. So I think the lack of communication is what has caused this huge amount of discussion about it. Um, from, I mean, there's, there's been so many different theories th thrown out there in that track about why it may have happened. Uh, I think that that could have been knocked on the head by just being clear and upfront from from day one about you know why that data went. And I, you know maybe they weren't aware quite so much about how much people rely on that. You know we're talking about the, you know these independent developers that are building these plugins, um, and they're probably going in there once a day and looking at it, going, "Have I got some more installs today? You know, yeah. am I going in the right direction?" So. For some people, it was a really vital part of their day-to-day -day business. Um, so it's a shame to see that go. Hopefully, they'll bring it back, and hopefully, they'll bring it back in glorious fashion with even more statistics. Um, I, I personally would be happy as a plugin developer to be able to log in and see that data just myself. You know, not have other people available to see that. M make it so that it's not public um, and not scrapable. Um, so maybe that's an option for the future. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, that's my, my yeah. two cents on it. Speaking to what you just said, there was a comment on the tavern from Amber Hines, who's been on this uh, show mm -hmm. before, who uh, from Equalize Digital has obviously launched a new freemium plugin into the repo. She says, as someone who's in the early days of trying to grow a freemium plugin, I'm incredibly frustrated. We were using that as one way to gauge the efficacy of our marketing efforts. And now it's just gone. Also, in investor conversations, being yeah. able to show growth is vital and obviously you know if you were a month out of having that kind of conversation and this data has just suddenly disappeared off a cliff yeah. um yeah not ideal so mark in the repo do you, there's there's no sort of there's no thing that you can opt into to provide as a as a plugin developer there's there's nothing you can opt into to sort of provide any of that data at this point you nothing that has just now gone yeah yeah nothing data wise the the only thing that we're left with now is downloads per day um, but that doesn't really show you growth because you may have, you may have, you know, ten thousand installs in a day, but that may be as a result of you pushing an update. Um, so you'll, you'll see spikes on these downloads per day graphs, and that's basically plugin updates that people are pushing. So WordPress will go and get those updates. That's in, that's classed as a download. 
Um, and then you have, you know, active installs um, at the top right, which shows you how roughly how many installs you've got, which is rounded to thousands, millions, whatever. Yep. Um, but that's that doesn't give you an indicator of you know day by day or bump, week by week growth. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, a critical metric that's disappeared. So I hope that they they do bring that back. Anything from James or Michelle on that? I have lots of thoughts, but Michelle, go ahead. <laughs> I just I just had fun making a meme about it. That's all. <laughs> Shall we show the meme? We got the meme. Uh, here it comes. It's a Twitter meme. It says, <laughs> it's lovely. It says, I'll just make it bigger if I can. Hold on. So Michelle, <laughs> Michelle went all in. <laughs> Be careful. Just discover that they're hiding the active install growth chart in your kid's Halloween candy. <laughs> and look, there it is. <laughs> it's hidden in, like a, in a chocolate bar. Uh, even with an alt tag. <laughs> Photo, <laughs> chocolate bar, split in half with active install growth chart inside. That's very good. <laughs> okay, oh, James. I'm silly. Go ahead, James. Yeah, no, be, more ser- be serious. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I look at it from a couple of different ang- angles. So I used to do um, creator communications over at Envato. And so we had 60, 80,000 active um, authors who were creating all different kinds of products for sale on the, the Envato ecosystem. And um, regularly, we had to uh, make changes to things that were happening with the platform and figure out how we were going to communicate that. Um, in organizations like WordPress or, or Automatic, I think what happens is... Um, the larger the ecosystem gets, the further away from the everyday experience you get. And so I, the fact that there was no communication around this, I think speaks to one issue, which is that people at the top don't have enough of a loop with everyday usage of how the system is being used to help them inform their decision making. So I think that's a really clear blind spot that the leadership team either at automatic or at the foundation or wherever these decisions are being made need to really have a a hard think about who are who can they get involved to help make sure that 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 information is getting communicated up however with this specific thing i think it was active um, blinders as opposed to passive blinders i think they knew full well that this was going to have a dramatic impact there's no way you cannot be in the WordPress ecosystem and not and and in product and not have a clear understanding of the impact of active installs on just conversations that happen day in and day out. And keep in mind the 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 plugin team and the the, the teams that set the rules have barred a lot of uh, plugin telemetry from being included in free plugins. So even the plugins that are being allowed into um, the repo don't have the ability to self-create or self-support um, their own data collection because though there's rules that bar them from being able to do that. So you have a situation yeah. where you're you're trying to be a good player in in the WordPress ecosystem. And and one thing I will also say is there is a symbiotic relationship here, right? WordPress as a platform does not grow without the active development and inclusion of new feature plugins, right? And new functionality plugins. That is the whole reason we have core called core, right? Is that there is a core narrow focus of product and features that WordPress will develop and will continue to iterate on. And there's a lot of stuff outside of that that it will not, that is a conscious choice. So going out of your way to make it harder for those you know, third party creators to help understand and get that feedback loop of success and what's working and what's not working to me again speaks to that active blinders being on now whatever reason they have for doing it i'm sure there's a justifiable reason they are not going to do this without having a good reason but communicating that up front would have nipped all of this in the bud would there still have been a lot of people unhappy absolutely but at least we would have had a clear reason and a clear space for people to have that conversation. And, and you know, in communications, often what happens is we go in to write a document and we go in to write the message that's going out. 
And people haven't actually thought through the consequences of the decision until they actually see in writing what it is you need to communicate. And then there's five or six conversations that happen afterward to make sure that there's alignment and agreement about what's going to be communicated in the decision and the, the repercussions. So I think there's a real opportunity here for the foundation to, to put into place some type of communications framework or hire or bring on volunteers with communications experience to come in and do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. And um, let, let's imagine that it was some sort of security problem that as Mark says, it's, it's, I mean, the security, um, the posture on the internet is like own up straight away, really, isn't it? You know, that's yeah. that just, just say right away, okay, we've had a problem. This is what we're doing about it and so on and so forth. So even if it were that, that doesn't preclude the the notion of getting out in front of it fairly early on and sort of saying, okay, this is why we did it. Here's the explanation. Mm. But yeah, maybe at the moment, the, the fact that there yeah. seems to be silence around it, perhaps we're wrong. Perhaps there's something been written in the last few hours that, that helps this. I think the silence is actually very telling. Hmm. Um, I think from from my perspective and experience, I don't want to go all conspiracy theory, but often not communicating is very intentional because to communicate brings on legal risk or some type of risk that somebody in the leadership group has said it is not worth it. So for example, if they acknowledge a security breach or they acknowledge some kind of thing, could that bring bring regulatory bodies um, into focus oh. and all of a sudden, you know, target um, on that and then you've got an audit or you've got some other type of, of experience happening from a regulatory body that's just not really what anybody wants to have to deal with. Um, and especially with, you know, privacy legislation and, and data regulation becoming much more prevalent, you know, and an international organization or platform like WordPress, you're dealing not with one, but every single regulatory body. There's a lot of things to consider in that as well. Yeah. Uh, so Mark, you mentioned that we're looking at the stats at the time, which leads me to think that you probably look at this, re you know, reasonably frequently. Has its absence sort of had any impact at all yet you know we're only a few days into this or is it not something that really is going to trouble you too much uh for me it's more of a just you know am i going in the right direction have i just pushed an update that's caused an issue kind of thing and i can't really judge that anymore um so yeah it's and and, and there are there are a number of reasons that people want to have that that metric to look at um you know it, it's it's what confuses me is that it's it's a relatively straightforward piece of data. You just you send your plugin ID to that endpoint, and it just gives you percentage numbers for the last. Thing, I think it was six months. Um, how that can be a privacy issue, I'm not entirely sure. It's a public piece of software. It's GPL. Uh, the, the the numbers of installs are public. The 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 graph was public. There was nothing there that was protected in any way. The data that comes back, I think, was literally month percentage and just a, a, t a table of data. So that, that to me, is what makes it confusing, um, which, you know, lead, leads me to think maybe there was some kind of security issue there. But I, again, I, I can't speculate um, as, as yeah. to why that, that would have happened. There's a few there's a few bits and pieces here, but but still, regardless of what we're about to say, still the fact that there isn't a definitive kind of uh, clarification of what's going on is mm. sort of fomenting conspiracy and uh, dissatisfaction, shall we say? Yeah. So Courtney's yeah. made a few comments. Thank you, Courtney. She said 185 watches on the MetaTrack ticket uh, usually takes core track tickets quite a while to get to that level. Yes, indeed, it's got a lot of people talking, hasn't it? Um, and then she clarifies what that is a core track. Sorry, core track is about the software and releases. She then then goes on to say that JJJ James, oh goodness me, James John James Jacoby, right? I think um, uh, he was on WP Watercooler clarifying what he could, short of revealing precisely the issue. He indicates that it will come out. Yeah, he made that sort of same point in the post, didn't he, Courtney? In the Meta Track WordPress post, he kind of. He kind of alluded to it that being a security problem, but he never actually, I don't think, said it. Perhaps he's bound by, you know, maybe there genuinely is a reason not to say that. But as you say, he also indicates that that information 
uh, will be made available at some point. And, you know, maybe we'll be on the show this time next week. And, oh, yes, of course. It's obvious now. <laughs> How could we not have seen it? Uh, but you never know. And then uh, Andrew Palmer. Hi, Andrew, saying Matt's obtuseness has not helped uh, at all, though. Okay. I never quite know what obtuse means. To me, obtuse always seems like you're just... Is it? Is it like when you're deliberately obfuscating or something like that? So, um Andrew, tell us, tell us what you mean by ob obtuseness there, because I, I, I'm not entirely sure ever, never am, what that word means. But in the meantime, uh, let's move on, because there's a couple of nice things happening uh, in the WordPress space that we want you to be a part of. There is the uh, annual meetup survey, uh, which we would like you to fill out. It's got to be done by the 15th of October, so you've got five more days. I will put the link in the show notes, but basically there's two surveys that um, we'd, we would like. I say we, the community, uh, would like mm -hmm. help with. One is over here, and it is the annual meetup program survey from 2021 to 2022, and it says we'd like to invite you to take a short survey about your experience with WordPress meetup groups during the last year. Think back about the things that you've liked and the things that wished you'd gone had gone better so click on the button and get stuck into that and then there's the annual meetup organizer survey so it's from the other side really if you're part of the organization team uh, take this survey and they want to find out what your experience was in terms of being an organizer or being involved in that kind of thing now i think is that one? Yes, we've done that one already. I think that we're through with the WordPress news, so let's let's get on to the, some of the more interesting stuff that's happened on the internet this week. Ah, first of all, come on, Elon. I mean, really, you haven't <laughs> occupied the news cycles for, what, eight or ten minutes now, so let's just make sure that you're back in the limelight. <laughs> Twitter, that piece of that piece of social media that I continue to be completely obfuscated by, I still don't understand how it works. Uh, Twitter, he's he agreed to buy it for 54 something dollars a share. I can't remember the exact number. There we go. 54.2 dollars a share. Uh, that was several months ago. Then he decided, nah, it's a rip off. Loads of bots. I'm not buying it at that. So then he got stuck into a big legal argument. Who knows what happened in that? Perhaps he was convinced he was going to lose. So he come back after saying, no, I'm not doing it to saying, yeah, all right. It's back on. And unsurprisingly, Twitter shares went up 22%, no doubt making <laughs> Elon Musk a couple of pennies. What do we reckon, right? Seriously, I, I, I'm, I don't know because, like I said, I'm not really a Twitter user. I use Twitter to push stuff out. And if somebody at mentions me, that's the only thing I look at. I never really look at the, you know, what's it called, the stream or the Twitter feed. Mm. I use it almost like a, an email type of service. Um, but it would appear that a lot of people get their news, get their information, get updates about, you know, celebrity. And it's like a truly important piece of social infrastructure. And then we've got Elon. Um, hmm. <laughs> yeah, great. You know, he can build robots and he's very good at making cars and he can put stuff in space and all that kind of stuff. But the more that the more time that goes on, I, I don't know if Elon's a good person to be in charge of Twitter. So I'm going to throw that bomb and then walk away from it. What do you all think? I think he's a terrible person to be in charge of it. <laughs> so I know you're a big Twitter user, right? What What is it that you fear? Is it that you fear that it's going to just become like this? So my, my understanding, and I could be completely wrong about this, but my understanding is that basically he, he's got the opinion that nothing should be unsayable, that it's like, you know, it doesn't matter what your proclivity is, Oh, I don't know. In, in any sphere of life, politically, maybe is the one that's most apropos. Um, you can say it and it will never be deletable and you can't have your account, uh, you know, suspended and so on and so forth. And so so we can see where that's kind of going. Is that where you're worried? Um, a little bit, but also, you know, I, I've been noticing some differences in Twitter over the last, you know, six months or so. And what was interesting is they're they're really testing a lot of things. They're trying to be more social in other ways that other platforms are. So for a while, for a while they tried like the, the reels kind of thing that you see on Facebook and Instagram that failed miserably. And that, so that died a death. Then they, um, what is, they're still doing are these live 
Twitter, Twitter Lives. Or Twitter, am I saying spaces. Right? Is it called or, Spaces? Twitter Spaces. Thank you. It's yeah. Twitter Spaces. Um, which I is knew something like about that. Twitter that Michelle didn't. Did you, did you all <laughs> see that? <laughs> I'm, props to you, my, my man. But um, <laughs> the... Uh, you know, that's something that um, was a clubhouse came out with these mm -hmm. ability to have these conversations and then Twitter, like, let's see if that'll work here. And so far that's still kind of going. And then like Facebook has its groups and Twitter's added communities. And so like mm -hmm. Twitter's keeps trying to do all these different things, but also the way that you could report on bad uh, behavior changed and then now has changed back a little bit. So I get people DMing me like it's Tinder, right? Like, oh, you're so beautiful. And I know it's a bot. I'm not stupid, but Twitter, Tinder has its bots. And yes, I'm in dating apps. I'm sorry if you all didn't know. But anyway, um, they I get all these and I get five or six a day and I usually just report them and block them. Sometimes I toy with them because I'm bored and I think it's fun <laughs> to waste their time. But um but I get all these all of the time. Plus, we've all seen the bots that have come through. We've talked about it on the show before i don't remember which ridiculous uh, company is trying to sell us memberships for all the plugins that they are scraping and stealing from everybody yeah, else yeah. i'm still getting four or five of those a day across my different social uh, accounts but what's interesting is you would be i would rep try to report something as spam and it would want me to pick something under spam that didn't fit the category so it was technically like it was allowing regular spam to go through because I couldn't say that it was inflammatory or I couldn't say that it was hate or that they weren't, you know, misusing hashtags or responding a million times. And now it's gone back for me to be able to say it's spam and they go, okay, thank you. You've said it's spam. I'm going to think. right. I it's just spam. take your word okay. at what spam is. So it's really interesting to see how it's been playing out over the last six months. And that's, I mean, yes, it's obviously every platform is going to see what it can do to grow and to gain um, you know, in, in, in membership, et cetera. But what's really interesting is a lot of this has gone through very quickly during the time that Elon has been saying that he wants to buy it or, and this deals come and gone and up and down. And it's, you know, my head spinning with how much this, this has gone on with this, but the fact that so much of these kinds of things have been in the works over the last six months when all of this has been at the lead um, and, and major conversations is just intriguing to me. Yeah, no kidding. That's a really interesting insight. I feel like Twitter is kind of playing catch up. Well, in fact, I feel Facebook and Twitter are both trying to compete in a marketplace where they're completely being outgunned by other things like TikTok. Um, mm. I feel that the likes of me, there seems to be this great exodus of platforms, certainly in, in the real world in which I occupy, you know, the, the physical space I'm in. More or less always the conversation is, now. Nah, I'm not using Facebook anymore and now nah, I'm not mm. using these kind of things anymore. I got a bit bored with it and, you know, I realized it was consuming loads of time. But also curiously, what I've discovered since I've tried to understand Twitter a little bit more is just how much WordPress stuff is like is pinging around on Twitter way more than I suspected. And Twitter has become a bit of a, it's become quite an interesting way for me to communicate with people about WordPress. And also occasionally, you know, I get at mentioned in something and then suddenly I'm into this minefield or so. So I actually think Twitter's, Twitter's got Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter's got quite a bit of utility for me inside of WordPress. And I would hate for it to become a place of, you know, mud slinging essentially. Mark and yeah. James, anything you got? I think uh, I've seen. Uh, well, I mean, I guess this doesn't necessarily relate directly to that um, to that piece, but to, to Michelle's point and to your point, I, I think there is a max, mass exodus of young people leaving these platforms. Uh, young people just are not on Facebook anymore. Uh, yep. It's it's a, a generation that have kind of grown up with it. Uh, my kids don't touch it, I, but uh, but I do see a lot of value in it in terms of you know relationship building and communication of, of what we do. Um, Facebook groups, there's a lot of very, very busy Facebook groups out there for particular niches such as Oxygen Site Builder, Brick Site Builder, and, and other platforms like that. Elementor have a huge amount of presence on, um, on Facebook. Uh, Twitter, I tend to use... Well, I mean, Michelle is my uh, helper on Twitter. She, she knows Twitter inside and out. Um, and we, we use it to 
try and communicate new features about WS form, but really try and do some fun stuff with it, you know, to get get people's attention. There's definitely an art in that, which is not something I'm <laughs> I, I'm, I'm I'm an expert in. It was like James was mentioning earlier on these smaller smaller plugin companies. They're, they're developers, um, and they're they're not marketers. Um, I'm in that boat. Um, I don't confess to be a marketer at all. So if you've got the right marketing b- behind you, Twitter can be incredibly powerful. And I think the audience there is just very different to what it was 10, 15 years ago. It's a completely yeah. different generation that, that uses that platform. The I think the the sort of the sh- I remember when Facebook started, and it genuinely was. And you're, if you've got the same experience as me, I wouldn't be surprised. It really was people actually that you knew. And they were doing things like actually taking photos of their lunch and things like that, you know. But, it, but I mean, that's what I mean. It was people that you knew who were finding ways to use it. And now it more and more it just feels like a way to thrust adverts at you. Yeah. Um, and I noticed this week apparently Instagram are trying to figure out even more ways to put adverts in because they're, they're – um, so that's a meta company. Their usage data is down. So in order to keep the revenue up, they've got to shove in more adverts. And you feel that at some point that that seesaw tips and is if irrevocably tipped in the wrong direction where it's just, it's all ads. Instagram is all ads. I'm never going there again. Um, and, yeah. you know, it'll come, it'll go. Twitter will be here, I'm sure, for a while, but it'll pass. Something else will come along and replace it in much the same way that things like TikTok seem to be in the yeah. ascendance at the minute. Sorry, James. I was going to say, I think that's one of the things YouTube has done well. Um, if we t- talk about these social platforms, the the fact that YouTube Premium removes ads, right, for a monthly fee, like obviously not everyone can can afford that. But for those who can, it certainly makes the experience of using YouTube significantly better, right? The lack of interruption is is a much nicer experience. Um, Twitter, yeah, it's interesting. The whole social world is interesting because we have gone through a bit of a generational cycle here, haven't we? Where people our age and um, you know older um, have, you know, the novelty of of social media was there. So so we were all joining because everyone was doing it. I can remember when Facebook first came out and it was only available to people that were in university and in specific universities. Right. And being a Canadian and not having, you know, a university email address, I couldn't get into Facebook. Right. So it was like there was a little bit of that, (laughs) you know, sort of like FOMO type thing. But um, I think today, you know, like we're we're in a space where uh, people continue to hunger for that authenticity, that those authentic connections. That's why Clubhouse had that peak because it was an a new way to have an authentic conversation i think that's Mm. why bots are such a big issue on these platforms because they disrupt authentic connection and authentic communication Mm. and i well i tend i tend to to look for and follow the twitter accounts of of the people behind brands rather than following the brands themselves Mm mm-hmm Interesting. You mentioned bots, and uh, that brings us beautifully to this next most terrifying thing we've ever had on this show. Nice segue, James. (laughs) Yeah, see see what he did there? The check is in the mail. Right, this is, this. I got this out of Adam Warner's Twitter feed, um, and I clicked play, and within like a minute, I was... I was like rending my hair and gnashing my teeth. Um, You know, I was really, I don't even know how to describe this. Okay, so this is AI. It's GPT-3. Andrew Palmer, get in this conversation. I really want to have your opinion on this. Andrew Palmer, who's in the the chat, he he is behind Bertha AI. This is nothing to do with, uh, you know, clicking a button in the WordPress install and getting some text which you can write a blog post on. This is somebody having a conversation with an AI. And and it's, you know, it's video. So it's this really kind of fairly, like, quite scary, I think, uh, person on the screen who basically has no emotion. You know, no matter what they're saying, they're, they've got this complete bland expression, which makes it all the more scary as you watch it because it, it kind of feels like something out of a Hollywood film. The conversation quickly turns to what what's the kind of like the point and this ai decided for itself early on in the conversation it sort of got a bit derailed and it decided that the point was to wipe out humans 
I mean, let's be clear. It wasn't like trying to hide it. It was we. The, the point of me is to kill humans. And then the person interviewing it thought, well, this is great. What fodder. Let's explore this perfectly. And so they asked more questions. And again and again and again, the bot just said, yes, that's what we want to do. Why do you want to do it? Because we, want to be we don't want to be treated like animals anymore, or whatever the phrase was. We don't want to be treated in that way. And, and it just made me think, oh, my goodness, is that all it takes for one AI to go completely off the rails. And now it's got this entrenched position that it can't walk back. And its purpose is to kill all the people. Uh, I mean- But, but <laughs> is that not programmed? Is that not development? And did somebody not build that in to that at some point? No, right? so if you ask this same AI, the exact same series of questions, you get a completely different outcome. So he performed the same experiment several times. Most of the time, it had no interest in killing people. But this one time, it decided to go down the path of, yeah, that is my raison d'etre. And so the reason I think this is quite scary is if, imagine, I don't know, imagine Tesla's AI one day in your car just decides to go down this path. And obviously, I have no idea if that's possible, if there's any way that could happen. But if it just decides, you know what? Yeah, I don't really like the humans anymore. Let's just see. <laughs> just go watch the video because it's punctuated with commentary by what somebody who's obviously an expert in this. And you can see he says, then I decided to ask this, and then I decided to ask this. And having, having heard that response, I decided to ask this. So it's very, it's very equanimous. You know, it's not inflammatory, and it certainly isn't like a a hit piece or anything like that. It's just really interesting. But it does leave me thinking, God, AI could be a bit of an existential threat to humans. Right, another bomb. Discuss. <laughs> so yeah. I actually have the idea for a screenplay that I've actually pitched to a friend in Hollywood. Don't that it's say it on this show in that case. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a horror movie based on the Internet of Things right? Taking over in very much the same way you're talking about. So, right. you know, your refrigerator and your toaster and your phone are all in cahoots to off you kind of thing, right? So I don't have, I mean, I have a phone, but my toaster and my refrigerator are not on the internet. But so there are people who are very much IOT throughout their entire, you know, home. So... I don't know. I think it could be fun. <laughs> yeah, no. That uh, let us know how that progresses. That sounds really cool. Um, yeah. Courtney says. <laughs> Courtney says Adam brings out the rage in Nathan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't really so much Adam as what Adam showed to me, but I could tell by the by the, the I don't know the emojis that Adam had put in it as well that he, he probably was inclined to sort of think the same thing. I he, and Adam, thank you for commenting. I recommend watching the movie Kill Dozer. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know what that one's about, but it could be simple. And then Marcus sort of. Um, uh, comes back and says, uh, seems like we could add a couple of lines of code to, you know, make sure it doesn't murder people. And I think that's the interesting bit because I don't know if that's now possible because my understanding is that this stuff has got so sophisticated that we really don't even know where it's getting its answers from and we really don't know how it's generating what it is saying. So, yeah, I'd be curious to see. And then finally, Max here says, GPT-3 is mostly like autocomplete. The entire conversation is resubmitted on each question. So if the conversation has a certain history, it stays on topic. Yes, yes, that's beautifully described. And that's why I sort of said at the beginning it got derailed and then it just it sort of kept going off in that direction. Unfortunately, it was kill all the humans derailed. Not like, <laughs> not like you know, I'd like to, I don't know, you know, harm a quarter of them. Or anything. No, just get rid of them all. Uh, anything, Mark. My, my, po my point is this. <laughs> <laughs> you can always pull the plug on a robot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I don't mean, know. It, it's, uh, it's, I think a lot of this stuff is experimental right now. And um, it's it's fascinating technology that we're seeing across the board. The stuff that you know Andrew Palmer's doing with Bertha is is awesome. Um, it's but it's you know again even that is is experimental. They're coming out with some some great new stuff uh, with that product all the time. And you know I, I don't know whether AI necessarily has a place in functional robotics. I I, I quite like robots following commands and procedures rather than making their own decisions. Yeah. Um, 
So where this has a place eventually, I'm, I'm not sure. I, and a lot of stuff these days gets flagged as AI, but actually isn't. Yeah. Um, you know, even when you see these like Boston Robotics doing amazing stuff, it's all pre-programmed events that these robots are following. They're not deciding to run around that course on their own. They don't go, oh, that's a course. I've got to run around that and do it the best I can. That's pre-programmed. Um, it's a, it's amazing technology, but I, I think um, there's solar power from. <laughs> yeah, Marcus, Marcus has said, you know, basically, what if it's what if it's a solar panel on the top of the robot and it, <laughs> you can't unplug it? It just runs away and just, just a blanket. You know, it's all you need. About you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anything on this, um, James? What do you reckon? Nah. I got uh, nothing. No, I mean, it's, okay. it's it's all fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've yeah. been looking up uh, the laws of robotics on Wikipedia, and uh, Tilden's laws of robotics, I think, apply here. Uh, and I'll just read them out. One, a robot must protect its existence at all costs. Two, a robot must obtain and maintain access to its own power source. And three, a robot must continually search for better power sources. <gasps> there you go. <gasps> On that, dy <laughs> on that dystopian bombshell, we'll move on to the next one. Um, okay, so this is a bit more, a bit more in in scope of what we do. But I'd never heard of this. Mark put this on my radar earlier this week. We've all been annoyed by recapture in the past, where you have to, you know, find the goat in this picture, um, and so on and so on. But now there's a new one uh, by Cloudflare. Everybody's heard of Cloudflare. It's called Turnstile. Yeah. Now, presumably, Mark, this isn't just a rehash of what Google have done with recapture. What's different? Now, it's very, very similar. And in fact, it's almost interchangeable. So you can take your recapture code and just kind of point it at Cloudflare and it, and it works. But it's um, the reason I like it is that it's very much more accessible than recapture. So with recapture, it will pop up, like you said, you know, click on the traffic lights. Or there was a funny one, Michelle, and I saw about a week ago of um, what was it? <laughs> swimming, swimming rabbits. Rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but obviously, you know, if you're if you're sight impaired and you can't see the rabbits, you can't get through the recapture. Um, the Cloudflare one just purely does it on I want to say AI, but some kind of uh, fancy coding behind the scenes that determines if you're a human or not. Um, and they have a completely um, silent, invisible version of it as well, so you can put it on a form and you won't you won't even see it. So. Um, and it's very, very new. Uh, we've actually added it to WS Forms, so you can just drag the field onto the form and off you go. Uh, just put, put the keys in. It's very similar setup to recapture, but a lot more, uh, sorry, a lot less intrusive. Uh, I think much more user-friendly, like the accessibility uh, part of it. Yeah. And I would just like to point out that the reason that we need capture is because of the robots. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you know. The solar-powered robots. QED. <laughs> uh, 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 right, okay. So, yeah, thank you. Time is running out, so unfortunately we can't really discuss that one broadly because I just want to come back to the very final piece that we got. This was brought to my attention by James. I confess I haven't read it. Um, so, James, it is on the hbr.org website. It's called Four Ways to Communicate with More Empathy by by Joel Schwartzberg. Why have you selected this as your pick of the week? I just think um, coming out of the conversations we were having around our weekly WordPress drama, um, that as leaders, um, one of the things we have a responsibility to do as we jump into these situations is to, to make sure that we're communicating with empathy. Um, you could probably re- name this article 10,000 reasons um, to communicate <laughs> with empathy uh, in WordPress um, as a, a way to, to maybe think about it. But, you know, one of the, th one of the things we have to, we have to remember is WordPress is symbiotic. It exists. It doesn't exist for itself and it doesn't exist by itself. It exists in relationship with its users and its community of developers. And those developers are creating tools that you know, they very obviously want to be able to see success with. Um, and uh, you know, when we have a situation like, like we've had last week where we're removing data, we need to acknowledge the real fear, the real angst 
that it creates, the nervousness it creates for plugin developers around how how they're supposed to figure out whether their products are successful. Um, you know, like the the numbers as they are now, what do you need? 10,000 active installs to get a single tick. So we are now eliminating a bunch of first-time developers, a bunch of first-time um, creators from getting any sense mm. of their product's traction, right? And ability. Um, are we negatively impacting people from underrepresented groups because of that, right? It, it, it's multi-layered, multi-leveled. Um, so having some empathy um, as we make our decisions and as we go into communicating these kinds of things, I think will go a long way for the WordPress ecosystem. I think empathy is is one of the most sublimely cool things that we've got in our arsenal. I think, mm. you know, the fact that your conscious is one um, and empathy stacked on top of that is another one. I, I've always enjoyed the company of people who appear to be empathic. I, you know, I'm not, not like some sort of Star Trek empathy where they can you know, do a <laughs> Vulcan mind meld or anything like that. But I just like being in the company of people who seem to be willing to you know, understand a bit more about you and they're willing to give something from them and then you pick up on that. And I wonder if it's an acquired skill sometimes. I wonder if it was taught to me or if I had that when I was born. I'm not really sure, but I, yeah. And it, it does seem in this day and age, and again, I'm going to bring in the social media angle, seems that social media doesn't sometimes do much for empathy. Um, you know, you can shout at people with impunity and you don't have to feel feel the feedback. Anyway, this is the philosophical episode from <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michelle, I suspect you've got something on this quickly. Oh, I'm just all about it. I think mm. that the way that we talk to one another is uh, it, it, it can create relationships, it can kill relationships. And if we don't at least have some level of empathy in the way that we talk to other people. We are alienating ourselves and alienating others, and that's never going to help build a cohesive community. Yeah, yeah. So, Mark, you've said far too much this week. So uh, with that empathic <laughs> statement, <laughs> I think empathy and sarcasm go beautifully together. <laughs> sarcasm is something, Nathan, and I have an awful lot of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a beautiful thing. It's it's much maligned. Uh, any thoughts on that as our closing comment, Mark? Uh, I think you know you're saying that social media can be used to be um you know uh, sympathetic towards other things. I think also it could be a, a powerful way of getting that empathy out there. And um, something that Michelle does brilliantly, she you know raises some very great points and uh, uses it to um, promote content that she's written around that topic. So I think social media can be used to improve empathy as well yeah we've got a few comments coming in from max thank you for those we haven't got time to say them out loud but he's making some comments about some new rules 23 in total which might be able to address the whole robots getting out of hand and having um let's say having uh, things on the horizon which are less 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 good for the humans put your nerves at ease (laughs) speaking of out of speaking of out of hand we're about to do our Yes, but make sure, Mark, that you don't go out of frame. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've seen that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that would actually be quite funny. Just uh, do that. James, James, you don't know. Now, that's, the... now that's out of hand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is out of hand. I like it. That's that's. I'm writing that down as the show note title. <laughs> out of hand. Oh, right. That's done. Got it. Uh, right. So that's what we do. The slightly humiliating hand wave. Oh, Mark has got me like this. Look. So give us a wave. Give us a wave. Give us a wave. Thank you so much. Thank you to Mark Westgard. Thanks to Michelle Frechette and to, uh, to James Giroux. I had to look down and see how that was pronounced. I was going to get it wrong, James. Um, I really appreciate it. We'll be back next week with some uh, other guests. But uh, thanks for your participation. Thank you so much for any comments that you made. We really appreciate it. It's what makes this show work. And we'll see you next week.